Welcome, welcome everyone. How's everyone feeling this afternoon? Excellent. Yeah, there we go. That's what I like. Uh, so next up we have Mr. Eric Pinkerton from Trustwave talking about pandemic pole po polemic, which is a tongue twister. Uh, so Eric has been breaking things just to fix them again since he could walk uh, at 20. <laughs> he spent his summer evenings as a nightclub bouncer and read tarot cards during the day. It's quite, it's quite a deep, deep, deep man. <laughs> uh, so I'll leave it at that. Can we just give a very warm round of applause for Mr. Eric Pinkerton? Thank, thank you very much. Um, oh, slides, big spiders. Um, so first off, it behooves me to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the beautiful land where we are today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and of course to acknowledge any First Nations people in attendance today. Let's jump in. So first up, what is this talk about? Um, the story was that I was trying to come up with a subject for a talk at the very last minute, uh, and I hit up a few people who I know are good, at, good at ideas, and Nick, my boss, had this idea which was that because COVID is kind of like this giant agile project that the entire world has been working on for the past few years. And a big chunk of that project is how do we change community behavior? And given that a big chunk of what we do in the cybersecurity world is try to change community behavior, surely there must be lessons that we can learn from the things that we've observed that we can perhaps somehow shoehorn into the way we deal with cybersecurity. And I submitted my paper, and because the OSSERT people have a soft spot for me, they accepted my paper. And me being a little bit ADHD procrastinated until a few weeks before the conference when I sat down to write the talk in a, in a bit of a panic. And therein I found the problem that was there wasn't that much in common. Now, there was lots of commonalities between COVID and cybersecurity, but I ended up going down this really weird and dark path, and that's what I shall talk to you about. So the obvious uh, correlations with cybersecurity, we can draw border controls a bit like firewalls and sewage testing I thought was a bit, a bit like threat hunting and a COVID safe app was a little bit like Pokemon Bow. Um, and really I think what it boiled down to is, is a philosophy that I've had for quite some time in security in that most of the problems in cybersecurity boil down to the fact that people are a little bit rubbish. Uh, and, I, and I often come back to this. And as I dug, I realized just how rubbish people were. So let's try and get into it. So humans have this tendency to think about things in very simplistic terms and quite binary things. And we think about people as being good or bad. So if you imagine on a spectrum of, say, Hitler to Dave Grohl, um, the bad ones have horns, obviously, and the good ones have halos. But we work in cybersecurity, so we know that the reality is far more nuanced than that. Good people sometimes do bad things, bad people do good things. People can be born bad or have badness thrust upon them, perhaps as a result of external factors, like, I don't know, their parents giving them too much screen time when they were kids. And behaviorists have started to wrangle this using something called the dark tetrad, which is a bit of a tongue tree in itself. So the dark tetrad is narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy and sadism. Sadism is sort of late to the party. It used to be a dark triad until someone came up with, with actually we need to accommodate sadism in there. Now you'll notice that I left, oh, where's my mouse pointer gone? Completely disappeared. Oh, you, oh, it's no good up there, is it? Let me see if I can get it. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, you'll notice that I've let the M in Ma Machiavellianism run off onto the next line, which is probably a sign of a bit of psychopathy and uh, sadism on my part. Uh, the fact that I was too lazy to change it and the fact that I'm sort of making a joke out about it is probably a little bit of Machiavellian in itself. So the interesting thing is what happens in the nexus of these four things, and we end up with people who are pure chaotic evil. And by that, I'm talking Angela Brisk, and you might be wondering who Angela Brisk is. She was the person that turns hot dog water into ice cubes for the people she doesn't like. So we have this these number of people out there who are pure chaotic, chaotic evil. Now, during this COVID pandemic, we find ourselves trying to change 
the behaviors of lots of different people. And generally what we see is that most people will do the right thing. They're happy to be told that this is the right thing to do. And for the greater good, we need to wear masks. We need to get vaccinated. We need to do lockdown. We need to sanitize our hands. Most people go along with that. And I, I lean heavily on the Parento principle, so the 80-20 rule. So if 80% of people are prepared to do the right thing when asked, what's going on with the other 20%? What's happening in that space? Now, some of them are not going to do what they're told or not going to be amenable to this because they're ill-informed, because they've been given misinformation, because they're arrogant, because they're ignorant. But there's this little tiny part of the population that are, there's a sort of this uh, chaotic evil piece. Um, and the interesting part compounding that issue is that often the people who are informing the, the community in what they need to do, um, you find people that are in this dark tertiary highly represented in that cohort. So what I'm talking about is the fact that people in the political sphere, people in the media, are often um, there by virtue of the fact that they exhibit these sort of evil, signs of evil. And if you don't believe me, you just really need to look through history. Um, and they're, they're the people just, no matter what, they will not do what they're told. So when you start talking about, you know, the, these evil narcissistic people, what you know, the, the, this, these claims have been leveled at our friend Scott here and a few other people in the government. And then you start to, to consider that if the good people are happy to do the right thing because they're told to do the right thing, but now the people who are telling them to do the right thing are perceived as being bad or, or untrustworthy, you, um, you have this, it compounds that whole issue. Um, so let's look at some of the, the management incentives that we had to try and influence people to do the right thing. So we told them positive incentive is the right thing to do. It was our path to freedom. We could get out of lockdown if we did the right thing, if we got vaccinated. There was some financial incentives that were offered. Um, you know, some people were paid to get vaccinated in certain places. We were told it would get the economy back on track. It would get people back in the workplace. Uh, and on the negative side, those incentives, we were told, well, Obviously, if you catch COVID, you could die or you could be very sick. You could get fines for not being compliant. You could end up in prison. You could be publicly shamed. There was peer pressure and there was lockdowns. If we try and take some of those, I guess, ideas and apply them into cybersecurity, there's not that much we, could, we can use. Um, I think, you know, financial incentives, the only thing I could think of there was um, SurveyMonkey who had this discount on your uh, subscription if you paid, uh, if, sorry, if you enabled MFA, they give you a discount. They've since withdrawn that because now they can just enable MFA by default. Um, the other thing we can try is a bit of public shame in the organization if you do the right thing. We can try uh, peer pressure, but really it boils down to um, adverse career impact. So if you're not going to do the right thing by security, it can aff affect your career. So, so this is where I started to think that, that maybe this stuff isn't that helpful. So I started reaching out for other things that I could draw correlations. The first thing that came up um, was attribution. So if you think of how much time we spent during the early stages of the pandemic talking and reading about attribution, where did it come from, who was patient zero, and we talked about it around the water cooler, and we burned a heap of cycles. And obviously there is a cohort of people who need to attribute, who need to know where this came from so that they can study it and understand it and make sure you know, we're, we're across this or in front of this as it happens again. But for 99.9% .9 of the population, it did not matter whether it came from you know, a wet market in Wuhan or whether it came from a mink farm in Denmark, which I think is very similar to cybersecurity where we tend to spend an awful lot of time on attribution. There are people that need to understand the attribution and do that, but for the vast majority of people, it's an absolute waste of time. The next thing that um, I started thinking about was the supply chain risk. Um, remember the early days of the, the pandemic where we were suddenly told that, that it could survive on cardboard for 72 hours and all of a sudden we were leaving our packages on, on the porch so that we didn't catch COVID. And really the, the net effect of that was that porch piracy went through the roof because people were just stealing all the packages. Um, the, um, the other thing that happened in around supply chain that was, that was kind of interesting 
was all of the, because the governments were giving, about, giving out big grants and big chunks of money, there was all of these um, people that were, ended up scamming the government. They were promising to deliver PPE that never turned up, or there was talks of organizations who were rebagging very cheap commodity face masks into packaging that made it look like it was an N95 mask because that's what they promised the government clients. Turns out there was a whole COVID testing clinic in the US that was, um, it, the whole thing was a scam and no one was actually being tested. They were just going through, paying some money, and then they would get a text message thereafter saying that they were negative. And the only reason this, pan this, this clinic got busted was, was because the timing was out and people were still in the queue while they were getting their negative results. And that led to some questions. So supply chain uh, ended up being incredibly fascinating in this space. I ended up concluding that we probably could teach more about su supply chain to the governments who were doing this because we're a little bit further down that road, even though we are nowhere near as far down that road as we need to be. And there's been countless talks that I've seen where people have alluded to the fact that supply chain is hard, we still need to crack that nut, um, and it's getting more and more complex. So I couldn't find any lessons to be learned there. Next thing, panic buying. So it turns out that the Australians uh, and their sporting culture that excels, that they excel at, led us to uh, dominate in other areas as well. And it turns out the Australians are the best in the whole world at panic buying. Um, I've heard that being a selfish bastard is an exhibition sport at the Brisbane Olympics in 2032. So we can look forward to picking up some, some uh, medals there. Um, it's an element of supply chain. Um, and it's interesting to look at what happens when the population gets a little bit spooked. Um, it happened to me, I went into a Mitre 10 to buy some I have some paint or something like that. And as I was in there, a coachload of people disgorged, ran into the shop and started literally pulling the face mask. The, and, it, and they were the painting face masks off the guy who was trying to put them out in the shop for sale. And everyone else in the shop was kind of looking at each other going, where did they come from? And what do they know that we don't? And we arrived at the till and I looked around and everyone in the shop had picked up a face mask because they were like, look, I, I, you know, what's going on here? So it, you can see how people get caught up in it. Um, so what, what can we learn from that? First, people are, are want to mirror the behavior of those around them to adopt social norms. And if those norms are positive, it's a great outcome. But if those norms are negative, then, then we have the opposite effect. Uh, I remember something that happened as we came out of lockdown and we started driving around. I found, as a bit of a socially awkward geek, I found lockdown kind of strangely pleasant and going to the supermarket when I needed to and finding I could park right outside and it was empty and there was no one else on the road, not, notwithstanding the fact that there wasn't all the products I wanted to buy. Um, I found it quite pleasant that I could go to the shops and what I started to notice is more and more people got on the road after a period of not being on the road they were driving really aggressively and I'd be driving and someone would cut me off and I'd sort of swear at them and then I'd drive around the corner and I'd cut someone else off. And it started to, I got this sense that I was propagating this problem. So I made a point that every time I got in the car, I tried to be nice and I tried to let people out and let people into the traffic and let old ladies cross the road. And I got this sense that the more I did that, the more the people who might be nice to went on and did something nice again. So there is this kind of strange thing where um, all that hippy-dippy stuff that we were told about putting positive vibes out into the universe actually were kind of becoming true and were, were manifest, which I thought was kind of mind-blowing. Next thing was masks. So masks are, you know, we're really fond in this industry of simple solutions to complex problems, and, you know, a mask is a very simple, simple thing. In the early days where PPP was unavailable, people were going out in plastic bags, which wasn't, wasn't ideal. Turns out masks are really complicated. And there's all of these different factors, uh, whether the person who's infected is wearing the mask or the person who is uninfected wearing the mask, whether it's the type of mask that filters on the ingress and the egress, um, whether it's been correctly fitted, whether it's an N95 mask, whether it's a new mask. So here we are, we're, we're turning out with this, this, what we thought was a very, very simple thing. And it turns out that it's, it was far more complex than we imagined. Um, the interesting thing, now I know what you saw, the first thing I saw this is, that's not a mask, uh, but they're not orchi bottles, so this is not a pipe. Uh, 
people were making their own masks, and the chaotic evil people were the ones that weren't wearing their masks properly. Or this lady who crocheted her own masks so she could still conform to the requirement to wear a mask, but it was doing sort of this weird passive aggressive statement that she made. The other thing that was fascinating is, do you remember the early days when we were told that um, you know, the mainstream media, for one, was pushing this narrative that there was no evidence to suggest that masks were effective? And I remember thinking at the time, that's kind of weird. That means that doctors have just been wearing them for shiggles for the last 100 years. So why are we being told that masks aren't effective? And it started to feel like the entire community were being gaslighted by the chaotic evil government so that they didn't go out and panic by masks so that there were enough masks left for the healthcare professionals who arguably needed them more. Uh, we'll probably never get to the bottom of exactly what happened there, but it was kind of curious. Um, and yeah, that, that just, I thought that was kind of very interesting. If the, if the government is misleading the population for, for various, event, various different agendas, <clears throat> there's precedent there, right? So if you remember the US uh, Drug Administration's food pyramid from the 1950s, it was this is what a healthy balanced diet looks like. And books were written subsequently that sort of argued that the food pyramid was less about arming people with the information to have a healthy diet and more about trying to you know, make people consume more of the things that were easy to store and lasted a long time and less of the things that were difficult to transport and, and um, would, would go off very quickly. So it was more about feeding the population after the war than it was about uh, making people eat healthily. And there are those that argue the entire obesity epidemic is a result of that arming people with the wrong information for the wrong reasons. Um, next thing that was interesting was, um, I call it sort of survival of the fittest. So the number of organizations that, that went out of business or were just put in stasis. Um, and then there was this thing that happened where there were a number of organizations who were somehow able to adapt and pivot. So we saw restaurants that were closed um, beginning to send boxes of meals to, to customers with this sort of like an experience, the experience of eating at this restaurant in your own home. Um, there were people who uh, ran escape rooms who were able to create virtual escape rooms online. So there's countless uh, sort of examples of these businesses that were agile enough to be able to change. And some of those were so successful, they will never go back to the way that they were. Um, in cybersecurity, what happened to me was I got dragged into a call because I used to be a, a networking firewall person. And the call was about an insurance company who'd moved their call center from a traditional cubicle call center into a um, everyone works from home kind of situation almost overnight. So now they were contending with the fact that they had 100 operators consecutively using a VPN that had been specced for maybe 10 or 15 concurrent users. And I was brought in, what can we do to squeeze the, 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 the most out of this? And the first thing I suggested was turn off encryption on the VPN, just go null encryption, you'll, you know, you'll get more through. And I came up with sort of about five or six different suggestions, but they were blown away by the idea of turning off encryption on the VPN. And I was, you know, this is a risk decision. As long as it's made with the right rationale, as long as it's a temporary solution, you know, this, this is just, a pair of tights around a fan belt to get you home, um, absolutely the, the, the risk of none of these people being able to do their job and not being able to service the customer is far greater than the risk of a, you know, a nation state attacker intercepting some of these calls. So it got me thinking to what you can do as a business to, to move some of the things or the barriers to being able to be agile and change what you, what you do. I know that the, the other thing that we had to change was um, we, I do an awful lot of tabletop exercises, which I always used to do face to face. Now we do most of those in a sort of hybrid where there's some people in the room and there's lots of different people connecting and it mirrors what would happen in a real event. For pen testing, we were sending drop boxes out to jobs that we previously would have definitely been internal testing because we were doing you know, on-site internal, maybe uh, critical infrastructure stuff all of a sudden we were doing that over, over modems and, and remote, so it was interesting. Um, personal responsibility is one of my, one of my favorite things. We, we try to rely on um, people doing the right thing and personal responsibility. 
Um, in cybersecurity, we try to do this. Um, and I, I, one of the, the things that occurred to me is if you um, come to this epiphany in the world of cybersecurity that a lot of the problems that we encounter are down to humans and it's a human problem, the mistake that a lot of people jump to is then thinking that the solution is addressing the people problems, which is they go and blow a massive amount of their budget on cybersecurity awareness training or phishing exercises without having thought about exhausting every technical solution they can to, to knock out the, the majority of those issues so that they're remained with a few things that they, ha they, they have no other option. So the example I give is if you ask someone to choose a password, you can use a policy to make sure they do choose a long password. You can't as easy or it's far more difficult to write a piece of technology or, or a piece of code that stops them reusing the same password over and over again. So as long as you've got all those technical solutions in place and you've exhausted your technology, then you put the rest of your, your budget into that awareness or that phishing stuff. Um, I've been had organizations try to buy phishing campaigns from me and I've asked them if they've got MFA and they've said no. And I'm kind of, you're wasting your time doing phishing training if you haven't got MFA in place. Um, the other thing that's interesting is um, we talk a lot about defense in depth in cybersecurity. And I remember this slide from when I did SABSA, which is again using this 80-20 rule. And this concept that they tried to present was that you can kind of layer, and with each layer you end up adding this, making it more unlikely. And you end up with a 1 in 1,625 chance of somebody who's able to circumvent all these different controls. And I thought about, well, in COVID, all of the controls that we used, we hit it from every angle. Um, and we think about, you know, ventilation, there was UVC lighting, lockdown, social distance, and so on and so forth. And now we've got, is that defense in depth? Is that us hitting it from every angle? But then you start to realize that those same people who won't do social distancing are the same people that won't do mask wearing, are the same people that didn't want to get vaccinated, the same people who aren't going to sanitize, the same people who, if they test positive, are not going to stay home. And you start to realize that that isn't really a defense in depth, it's just throwing a load of things at the wall and hoping that, that some of it sticks. Next one, working from home definitely changed the water cooler conversations. This was in, I think, Shenzhen, where a whole family were, were traveling with their homemade PPE. Um, it, um, we all were first, I'm guessing most of us in this room would have been forced to work from home. We had this really weird journey we went through where, I, personally, I felt really unproductive working from home. I'm ADHD, so my procrastination was, was really difficult. I found myself working funny hours. Um, I found myself trying to homeschool my child as well as work from home. Um, a lot of companies were terrified about the productivity of their people working from home. And I would have expected to see lots more data now and studies published with really answering the question, are we more um, productive working from home or not? And it turns out that the more senior and highly skilled you are, the less likely you're going to be productive at home. And what you find is that the call center workers and the relatively unskilled skilled people were far more productive and they were able to be flexible and they were able to, to, to manage their lives. Whereas the more senior people in the organization were going out shopping and, and weren't logging enough time. And the irony is that it's those senior people that are more likely to be given the latitude to work from home and manage their own time and, and vice versa, which I thought was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, my theory is that everyone's different and that's why we haven't seen that data on whether people are generally more productive or less productive. The study I found was that the, uh, the only real relevant study I found was uh, one that cited, um, I think it was, let me find the, the details. Um, I think it was, there was Microsoft, there was Splunk, and there was a firm. They observed a massive spike in productivity as people headed home into, into uh, working from home for the first time. And then they saw it drop off over the next few months as people sort of got lonely and, and was trying to adjust to that new work. And then it sort of seems to have picked up since then. Um, we've had lots of um, organizations that are trying to coax people back into the office because they're looking at spreadsheets and how much they're paying on that office space. Uh, and one interesting story was that Goldman Sachs CEO gave people an ultimatum 
that they had to be in the office next week, otherwise they would be fired, and apparently only 50% of people turned up. Uh, and it took many more emails and threats to get more people going into the office. I think the reality is that we're never going back. It's never going to look the way it was. What's happened is we've accelerated the natural evolution of, of this model. We've seen far more people move further away. And I think the future is going to be a kind of pay-as-you-go, we-work type scenario where you go and work in a... In a, in a community office when you want to, you work from home when you want to, you, you adapt to whatever that works to you. But the idea of people going nine to five into an office in the city, I think are long gone. Um, I think a lot of that CBD office space is going to end up being um, vacated and then it will be ultimately turned into um, residential or hospitality venues. And if you've ever been, ever been to Japan, you think nothing about getting in, going to a building and going to a bar on the fourth floor of a high-rise block. And I think that's what our cities will look like, give it another couple of years. So conclusion. So what did I really come to at the end of all of this? Um, or, or what's in it for me? Um, I think that the initial premise, this initial idea that there was lots of lessons that could be learned was probably wrong. If there are lessons, I don't think I really learned them. Um, it turns out my kind of mantra that people are rubbish is still a bit true. Um, technology is 80% of the answer. In a lot of cases, you can't rely on people to do the right thing. You've got to force them using technology. You've got to make the secure option the easy option. Um, you can't give them a choice between easy and secure because you know which way they're, they're going to go. Um, attribution is pointless for the common man. If you're still wasting time on it, don't, unless you really are one of those rare people that really needs to understand that. The devil is in the supply chain. Um, supply chain continues to and will continue to be a really difficult problem for us to wrangle, not telling you anything you don't already know. Masks are complex solutions for simple problems, despite what you originally thought. Um, think about doing what you can to design your organization to be nimble or move any barriers, because the COVID pandemic isn't the only crisis that we face as a, as a human race that is going to need us to change community behavior and change and adapt. And climate change is probably the next cab off the rank. It's not quite as acute. It's not going to happen as fast as we saw that COVID happen. But we are certainly going to need to adapt and change, both as, as individuals and businesses. Uh, try your best to stay off the dark to trout if you can. Uh, sell Goldman Sachs by WeWork and stock up on pasta and toilet roll and Panadol. And that's, that's me. We have plenty of time for questions if there are any. Uh, I have none online. I'll just refresh that in a sec just in case. It's my internet. All right, Mr. Glynn, I'll run over. Just heard this big sigh. <laughs> Much as I'd love to say the piss, I actually have a question. Um, I guess if, with COVID as the sort of backdrop to it, if you can't force people to do the right thing, and they're not going to follow you into doing the right thing? What is that third option to close the gap? If they're on your payroll, then you could probably use that to start the process of getting rid of them, maybe. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's always going to be that. Uh, you know, if we're talking about COVID, there's always going to be those people who aren't going to do the right thing. And you end up with this ratio. So the common ratio that we had was this idea that 80% of people had to be vaccinated before we were allowed out of our houses. And you know damn well that that 80% number was something a politician had come up with, not a medical officer, because you could almost feel the pain on their, on their faces as they stood behind the pollies who made that announcement and then pretended that they were acting on medical advice. So we all chase this, this, this 80%, 80%. So um, what can you do about the people who just will not do the right thing? Yeah, sort of deport them all and, yeah, it's just, I don't know, lock them all in Western Australia or, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, if it's people that you control on your own, in your own company. In terms of cybersecurity, it's much easier. You just tell, give them an ultimatum, do what I tell you or uh, go work somewhere else. It's how harsh as that sounds. Are there any other questions from the room? Oh. Uh oh. Um, you mentioned the whole point of um, like people wanting to follow what other people are doing to conform. And I've definitely worked in teams where 
everyone has a really strong security focus, even if we're a bunch of sysadmins, and I've also seen the polar opposite. Is there anything you can say to try to like force that culture to happen, to be the catalyst to then make other people care about it? Yeah, that's interesting. So we talk a lot about changing organizational culture, but when you try to define what it is that gives an organizational culture, it's quite tricky. And my belief is that it actually boils down to the personalities and the people in that organization. Um, and there's always a few people in an organization that kind of define or set the tone by their actions, by the way they do things. If you're lucky in an organization, the people at the top give a shit and, and, and that then shows through the way they do things and they're open and transparent. And that leads to, you find yourself working to an organ, in an organization where you feel like part of a family and you feel like everyone's on the same page. It's harder to engineer that than it is to job hop until you find somewhere it's organically happened. I'm sure there are consultants out there who will charge you a fortune to consult on how to, to do that. But whether you can take it, whether you can take an organization with a toxic work culture and turn it into one that's the, the opposite, I'd, I'd be skeptical. But then that being skeptical is my job, right? So yeah, I don't know. Sorry, I haven't got the answers for any of these things. I'd, I'd, I had planned to come up here with all these answers for you people, and I find out that all I've got is a rant about how people are rubbish and politicians are evil. So, And great, great photos of random PPE. And homemade PPE is just wonderful. Go and, go and Google search homemade PPE. I'd love to see so your browser history around the that. ingenuity of... Yeah. No, you don't want to see my browser history. It's uh, all, uh, the, so all the pictures of your holiday. <laughs> Um, I don't know how to take that, but I'll uh, go to the next question. Uh, what about the great resignation, no staff? Yeah, so the great resignation was an interesting thing because we heard about it coming because it was happening in America. And we were all a little bit panicky about Australia, that it was going to arrive like a season, like we were going to see this wave of it. So it was going to start at the East Coast, and then it was going to sweep its way across to Western Australia, who were still locked up and, and in lockdown. And it was a kind of very strange thing. We did an awful lot of thinking about in, in the company I work for because there's a skills crisis and reten you know, staff retention is a really big topic. How do you keep people happy, engaged? How do you engineer a culture that makes people want to stay? How do you know when people aren't happy? And what I sort of came down to thinking is that lots of people were unhappy and they were unhappy because of the general depressing malaise of lockdown and the, and the a little bit of PTSD that we all had from the process we'd been through. And they were sitting at home and they were a bit depressed and they were attributing that feeling to their job. My job, I'm not as happy in my job as I was last year. It's not as good as it, as it used to be. And they were then misdiagnosing the job as being, and then it was like, well, I need to change jobs. So they start a new job, which I think in a lot of cases would have been a real Band-Aid fix. A bit like when you're in a relationship that isn't going quite well and you go, oh, we'll, we'll get engaged because that'll fix it. And it fixes it for a few months and then you go, oh, it's, it's going downhill again, we'll get married. And then it fixes it for a few months and then eventually you either you go your separate ways or you have a kid. And, and, and yeah, so, and, and I think that changing jobs because you're not happy, I think those people are going to find in six months they're still not, it hasn't solved that problem and they'll be looking for another job. So there's lots and lots of people moving around. I don't think they're necessarily moving for the right reasons. Uh, and our industry being the way that it is, in that there's more jobs than people, people are taking big packages, or they're finding themselves taking a big package and working for an organization that they then, on reflection, feel that isn't as ethically aligned as, with, you know. So I think we'll, we'll continue to see people moving around. Maybe that's not a bad thing, because every time I've moved job, the learning curve has gone through the roof. So the, I, don't, I don't think job hopping is a necessarily bad thing, as long as it's not every six months. I think, I think it actually goes some way to upskilling. It creates a, a seat which pulls a sort of vacuum that pulls you know, less capable people in and gets them working. So maybe the great re resignation is actually a good, will be looked back as being a good thing for getting more people in this industry. Who knows? That's a very waffly answer that probably didn't answer the question, but there you go. 
Uh, there is a follow-up to that one as well. So, for example, if you threaten to sack them, as as you mentioned <laughs> before, uh, they're just going to go elsewhere um, for the same, if not more, money. Yeah, but better that they're not doing the right thing on someone else's payroll than on your payroll, maybe. So it's great if they go to so the you're offsetting the risk. Yeah, there, I, used to, I used to work for a rather large telco, and there was this thing that used to happen where you had to advertise jobs internally, and you'd advertise a role, and you'd get a resume through from someone that already worked for the organization. And then you'd have to have this conversation with their boss to say, hey, I've just had an application for a role I have open. Can you tell me about this person? And if that boss said, oh, he's the best employer I've ever had, you know, you have my blessing, you didn't want that person. Because you know, what you wanted was for him to say, oh no, you can't have him. Because, yeah, because there was, it was, in that organization, it's very difficult to get rid of people who weren't great, so they just got moved around. So maybe similar. I'll uh, have a few more minutes for some questions. Uh, there's nothing else online. Anything inside, inside the room? We've ex exhausted all the questions. Oh, I got a question. Or people are just fed up with my waffling answers. Do you want to hear a joke? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come on. Right. I've been trying to get them on point, so like on theme. So why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. Because the chicken behind it wasn't socially distancing. Nice. I like it. Very good. It did threaten me before, by the way. I said, it better be a funny one. All right, can we, can we give a round of applause?